Tear gas canisters being fired at protesters attempting to climb the gates near the Lebanese parliament. The country marking its 100th anniversary while protests continue over the country's leadership, especially in the wake of the last month's deadly port explosion. The president and the protests, President Trump on the ground in Kenosha, Wisconsin in the wake of the Jacob Blake shooting. Even after some local leaders asked him to reconsider, Trump still met by protesters and supporters while Jacob Blake's family members gather near where he was shot. No meeting with the president. Pandemic pressure, new warnings heading into Labor Day weekend with concerns infection rates could soar. And the nation's largest school district announcing it's delaying the first day of school after teachers push back. Eviction crisis nationwide falling attention to a nightmare, the latest on the fight for protections while so many Americans face being forced out of their homes. The desperate search for two kids swept away by flash flooding, their mother calling 911 from the car, rescue boats capsizing in the currents. And the boyfriend of Breonna Taylor speaking out. I can no longer remain silent. Suing the police department and saying he was standing his ground the night police executed a no-knock warrant. And our Clayton Sandell takes us on a road trip. Places that have become flashpoints in our nation's reckoning on racial justice. The painful histories associated with the very names of some of those places and the debate over renaming them. And good evening, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin with President Trump and America's latest flashpoint over race, policing and protest. The president traveling today to Kenosha, Wisconsin, as that community is still grappling with unrest over the police shooting of Jacob Blake and the aftermath of protests and counter protests in the days since. The president on the ground touring area businesses damaged during those protests and defending the alleged teenage gunman charged with killing two protesters this weekend, hours after the president compared the officers involved in the shooting to golfers who choke, missing a three-foot putt. Meanwhile, Jacob Blake's family gathered at the scene where he was shot in the back seven times, but they did not meet with the president. Alex Perez was covering it all and starts off from Wisconsin. Despite local officials telling him to postpone his trip, President Trump in Kenosha, Wisconsin today touring a building destroyed in protest after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Met by supporters and protesters, he pushed his law and order message. We have to condemn the dangerous anti-police rhetoric. It's getting more and more. It's very unfair. Uh, you have some bad apples, we all know that, and those will be taken care of through the system, and nobody's gonna be easy on them either, and you have people that choke. Repeating his suggestion that the police officer who shot Blake seven times in the back, quote, choked after comparing him to a golfer missing a putt. They Shooting can't. the guy in the back many times, I mean, couldn't you have done something different? They choke, just like in a golf tournament, they miss a three foot. You're pop. not comparing it to golf because, of course, that's no, what the media I'm says. saying people yeah. choke. Just blocks away from the president's event, the Blake family hosting a day of community service at the site of the shooting. All I ask is that um, he keep his disrespect, his foul language far away from our family. He's not meeting with you or the Blake family. What does that say to you? We're not mad. He's got an agenda, and we got one too. Our agenda is to get justice. The Wisconsin DOJ investigation into Blake's shooting still underway, and 17 year old Kyle Rittenhouse, who's accused of killing two demonstrators, remains in custody. Ahead of his visit here, the president defended Rittenhouse. I guess he was in very big trouble. He would have been, I, he probably would have been killed. Also condemning the fatal shooting in Portland of a man wearing a Blue Lives Matter flag and reportedly a hat belonging to a right-wing group. He was targeted. They targeted him. They shot him in the street and then they were so happy and he died. Repeating an unsubstantiated claim that so-called thugs plotted to fly to the Republican National Convention to incite unrest. The entire plane filled up with the looters, the anarchists, the rioters, people that obviously were looking for trouble. When asked, he provided no evidence. And when pressed about the demonstrations against racial injustice sweeping the nation, President Trump painted most protesters as agitators. Do you believe systemic racism is a problem in this country? Well, you know, you just keep getting back to 
the opposite subject. We should talk about the kind of violence that we've seen in Portland and here and other places. It's tremendous violence. Alex Perez joining us now from Wisconsin. Alex, you were there with Jacob Blake's family. What else did they have to say about the president? And give us a sense of how protesters and the president's supporters reacted to his visit. Well, Kara, it was really the tale of two cities here, two separate events happening simultaneously as the president was touring some of the damaged areas. Uh, Jacob Blake's family was having their own event, a community service event happening just blocks apart. And the people who were at one event were not at the other. And that's just a sign of how divided things are here at the moment. As the president was making his way into town, we did see uh, a number of people who lined the streets holding signs supporting supporting the president a few blocks away, Jacob Blake's family and those supporting the Blake family, the complete opposite, saying they want to see change in the White House, uh, asking for the president to address some of the issues involving the Jacob Blake shooting specifically and directly. Um, that's what we're seeing here on the ground right now, and it's really what we've been seeing the last couple of days. This community, like much of the nation, is divided right now, and that's become very, very clear, particularly today with the visit of the president. Kira. Alex, thanks so much. And for more on the president's visit to Kenosha, let's bring in our Terry Moran. He's in Washington. Terry, the president today focusing his attention more on damage from the protest than Jacob Blake's shooting by police. What do you make of how he's handling this and whether making this his message is actually effective? Akira, you're absolutely right. This is his message. President Trump has been asked several times now, what is his agenda? What's his vision for a second Trump term? And he has struggled to answer that. He has come up with an answer, and it is essentially an apocalyptic struggle between him uh, and, and disaster for the country. And he wants people to rally to his side, and he points to uh, incidents like Kenosha, like Portland, these places where violence has flared up around the Black Lives Matter protests to say, this is your future, America, if you don't come with me. Yeah, it's hard to say uh, if it's working or not. In Wisconsin itself, the most recent poll shows that Joe Biden has actually increased his lead there, small though it is, uh, and yet the there's something else interesting that's happened. It seems that people are naturally concerned about this violence. They seem to be blaming the protesters. The, the Black Lives Matter favorability rating has gone down, but that hasn't helped President Trump. Joe Biden is arguing that it's President Trump himself who's helping to foment, foment this violence. That may be getting through. It is a gamble because he's not offering a pragmatic program. He's saying it's me or disaster. We'll see if that works. Well, let's talk about the administration's handling of the pandemic. And it was today that we heard from Admiral Brett Girard, who's running the efforts on expanding testing. And he seemed to dismiss the idea of widespread daily, daily testing. Take a listen. It's great to talk about this utopian kind of idea where everybody has a test every day and we can do that. Um, I don't live in a utopian world. I live in the real world. And the real world had no tests for this new disease. Um, when this first started. We now have a huge diversity of tests. We can return to society without having everyone have a test every single day. But Terry, this runs counter to his message just a few months ago. Exactly, Kira. It was just in May that Admiral Brett Giroir promised 50 million tests a month by September. Well, it's September. On a good day, we aren't even at half that level, uh, and it's heading south. Testing is decreasing. Every other developed country that is our peer country in the world that's succeeding, whether it's Canada or Germany or Japan or South Korea, they are testing at a much higher rate than we are. They are contact tracing. They aren't just letting the virus kind of flow through the country testing here and there, trying to stomp out flare-ups. They're tracking it, testing it, containing it. And that's why in other countries, kids are back in school, businesses are opening. They're even having concerts in Berlin now uh, because they can manage this. And it is uh, really striking to see Admiral Brett Girard, who was assigned the job of standing up testing in America, saying, well, it's a utopia to think you can test that much. It's not in other countries. Uh, and it is a really big failure of the American effort on this pandemic. Representative James Clyburn, the chairman of that committee, a Democrat, said this shows the need for a genuine national testing program. 
Terry, thanks so much. Let's talk more about coronavirus. Today, the largest public school system in America announced it is delaying the start of school, bowing to pressure from the teachers union and strong words from President Trump directed at the nation's leading infectious disease doctor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who today had a warning of his own. This comes as some college campuses see cases rising. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has this report. Just days before return to school for more than a million children in New York City, classes delayed until September 21st to avoid a teacher strike over COVID safety demands. We've heard from everyone in our schools that have said we need some more time. Parents say they just want their kids to be safe. That has to be my first concern is the safety of my son. That has to be. I have no other choice. Safety comes first and so I'm going to put my trust in them. We recently got a look at preparations at New York's PS 532. Disinfection, space desks and open windows. Oh, yeah, so we Principal don't. Kevin Bowles telling Tom they'd be ready. Obviously, I take the safety of everybody in my community really seriously. And in spite of my confidence in this plan, there is of course, the reality that this is a scary and unknown virus. New York City schools now agreeing to randomly test students and staff each month. The federal government set to ship 150 million rapid tests to states to be used in the reopening of schools. The president again appearing to take issue with Dr. Anthony Fauci. I get along with him, but every once in a while he'll come up with one that I say, where did that come from? I inherited him. He was here. He was a part of this huge piece of machine. I didn't put anybody in charge. He was here. The nation's top infectious disease doctor brushing it off, saying he believes the president trusts his advice. I think that's kind of a distraction to pit me against the president. We're, we're, we're all on the same team. But Fauci once again finding himself at odds with the president, firmly dismissing a claim Trump retweeted, suggesting the death toll from the virus was only 9,000 because of patients with underlying conditions. That does not mean that someone who has hypertension or diabetes who dies of COVID COVID didn't die of COVID-19. They did. So the numbers that you've been hearing, the 180,000 plus deaths are real deaths from COVID-19. Let there not be any confusion about that. It's not 9,000 deaths from COVID-19. It's 180 plus thousand deaths. Dr. Fauci urging states not to let Labor Day celebrations ruin the fall. Colleges already scrambling to contain new outbreaks on campus. Ohio State reporting nearly 500 cases in just the first week of school. The state hitting 1,400 cases today, the largest single day jump since July. The governor pointing to the return of college and grade school students. If we want our kids in school, which we do, the way to do that is for us to s slow this spread down. And we now bring in our Eva Pilgrim. So Eva, there's a new public health campaign in the works from the Department of Health and Human Services. Tell us about it. Well, ABC News has confirmed that the department is pitching a $250 million public relations push. Now, Politico was able to obtain a letter showing that the goal is to defeat despair and inspire hope. Now, House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn says this looks like taxpayer money, $250 million worth of taxpayer money that's being used politically, but the administration insists that this is about health not politics. Kira? Well, we'll follow it for sure. Eva Pilgrim, thanks so much. Today is, of course, the first of the month, and for millions of Americans, that means the rent is due. And after federal protections against eviction were allowed to expire, anxiety is high for those unable to make rent, especially where there are no state protections. Tonight, we hear from some of those voices detailing their fears and their struggles. It's just been real, real hard, you know, this is something that I never was, that I wasn't expecting. And it just like, just wham, it just came on me. We don't know what to do, you know? And we look into the leaders for extra help. The money before, it was like, okay, I can, I can pay lights and gas. Now it's a toss up between rent, car insurance, lights, gas. We don't know what's gonna happen here. We don't know what's gonna happen at a job. We don't, like everything is in limbo. They've been working with me, but then it comes to a point, they gotta have their money too. But you get to a point in your life where you really don't wanna have to keep asking people, what kind of 
can't walk in it, but I can't even take care of my own family. can't even take care of my own family, and it's only two of them. And late today, Trump administration officials said the CDC will use its authority to temporarily halt some of those evictions. This would apply to individual renters earning less than $99,000 a year. It's unclear how the Trump administration will actually enforce that order, though. And now to an urgent search for two missing children after their mother's car was swept away by floodwaters in North Carolina. Rescue crews were able to pull their mother to safety but lost hold of the children in the rushing waters. Rescue boats overturning during that desperate search. And in Oklahoma, more floods trapping drivers. ABC's Marcus Moore has the latest now on the dangerous flooding. Tonight, desperate high water rescues playing out in two parts of the country. Outside Raleigh, North Carolina overnight, a mother caught in floodwaters calling 911. Her car swept off the road with her two children inside. First responders rushing in. They got into the water and they were able to rescue a child and the mother. The water was so turbulent that the boat capsized and um, they lost the, the child. A total of four swift water boats flipped over. The surge expanding today. Helicopter brought in, still no sign of the children. One second, sir, one second. Not far from there. We gotta get all these cars out of the way so EMS can get through. On a rain slicked Interstate 95, witnesses springing to action, helping two elderly people trapped in this overturned car. We're trying to try to get you out, okay? Thankfully, neither appeared seriously hurt. And in the Oklahoma City area, up to a month's worth of rain in just a few hours, causing scenes like this. A car pinned against a railing, surrounded by powerful floodwaters. Man in his 50s is missing. And Kira, tonight flood watches are up for North Texas through Thursday, and they expect up to six inches of rain to fall here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, creating that potential for dangerous flooding. Kira. Marcus, thanks so much. And for more on the extreme rainfall, let's get to ABC News Chief Meteor or Meteorologist Ginger Z. Hey, Ginger. Yeah, Kira, we saw anywhere from six to eight inches of rain anywhere from Oklahoma to North Carolina, and a lot of that fell two to three inch per hour rainfall rate. So that's why you still see the flash flood threat on the map. But the tornado watch is relatively new, and you need to be on the lookout from Little Rock over to the state line of Mississippi and Tennessee. So keep an eye on those storms, even from Memphis tonight. But we also want to focus in on how much rain. This is a stationary front. Stationary, just like it sounds, doesn't move much, and you're not going to see it move much in the next 24 to 48 hours, and that's why I anticipate some of these spots will pick up an added couple of inches, and I mean three to five inches in some of those zones in the next couple days. And then finally, I wanted to leave you with the tropics. You've probably heard we've got two more named storms. Nana, that will go through the Central America and over the Yucatan Peninsula, and then Omar, which thankfully, even though it looks very close to the United States, looks to turn off to the right and stay a fish storm. Kira? Ginger, thanks. And we turn to the case of Brianna Taylor. Today, her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, said he was standing his ground the night police barged into Taylor's apartment and Walker opened fire. In a new lawsuit, Walker is asking for immunity under Kentucky's Stand Your Ground law, saying that he and Taylor had no idea who was breaking into their apartment when the police served that no-knock warrant. Walker shot and injured one officer and police killed Taylor, a 26-year-old EMT. I was laying in bed with Brianna around midnight watching a movie. All of a sudden, someone started beating on the door. They refused to answer when we yelled, who is it? 15 minutes later, Brianna was dead from a hell of police gunfire, and I was in police custody. The police arrested, jailed, and charged me with murder of a police officer. I was raised by a good family. I am a legal gun owner, and I would never knowingly shoot a police officer. Brianna and I did not know who was banging on the door, but the police know what they did. The charges brought against me were meant to silence me and cover up Brianna's murder. For her and those that I love, I can no longer remain silent. And an update now on that recent attack in California. Today, the L.A. County District Attorney's Office announced that two men have been charged with robbery and potential hate crimes after an assault on three transgender women on Hollywood Boulevard last month. The attack all caught on camera. If convicted, the men could face some eight years and eight to 13 years in prison. 
Turning to that new investigation involving the steep and swift fall of one of America's most powerful evangelical leaders, Jerry Falwell Jr. He was forced to resign as president of Liberty University, the country's largest Christian college, amid a very public sex scandal. The university announcing it's launching an independent probe now into all facets of Falwell's, Falwell's tenure, including his financial records and real estate deals. Liberty University announcing an independent investigation into its former president, Jerry Falwell Jr., after the embattled evangelical leader of the largest Christian college in the country resigned amid an alleged sex scandal. The Board of Trustees issuing a statement last night, now calling for a thorough investigation into all financial, real estate and legal matters while Falwell was at the helm of the school, hiring a top forensic team to do the job. Falwell's exit coming after a series of scandals. First, this racy photo he posted on social media with his arm around his wife's assistant. He apologized and took it down, saying it was just in good fun from a costume party. Then the explosive news story about Falwell, his wife Becky, and a pool attendant and former business partner Giancarlo Granda. The 29-year-old claiming he had a seven-year affair with Becky as Falwell at times looked on. Falwell no denies any involvement. Granda spoke in exclusively way, with GMA start, on Friday about the affair. Jerry's lying. Um, that was his game plan from the beginning to just throw her under the bus. Um, which I, I think speaks a lot about who he is, about his character. Um, and he was aware from day one of our relationship. But a former personal assistant to the Falwells is now speaking out, defending the couple as committed to the university to a fault. Their sacrifice uh, to the university, um, obviously, it appears took a toll on their personal relationship and they just wanted to ensure that students had a great experience and they felt that Liberty was a home away from home. And the Falwells telling me tonight they welcome this investigation and that this entire process will vindicate them. A source connected to Liberty University also telling me tonight this outside investigation was launched due to an increasing demand from its board members and donors. The Falwells telling me they have nothing to hide. When we come back, our road trip to some places that conjure up America's hateful history and why some community members are standing in defense of a painful past. Incredible rescue. New York City firefighters with a rare maneuver 16 stories up. And could men be disappearing? The new research on the Y chromosome and what it could mean for humankind. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. Mother Nature setting the rules, and all I got to do is slay her game. It happened so quick. New season of Life Below Zero, followed by the premiere of Next Generation, Monday, September 7th at 8, on National Geographic. In America, you've got to earn respect. I'm the boss. This is my town. They're going to war with us. We'll kill them all. There's a big fish out there. We're the future. They're the past. They just don't know it yet. Fargo, September 27th on FX. Next day, FX on Hulu. Now, with so much on the line, ABC News, America's number one news, is right there for you live on Hulu with stories of strength, stories of hope. Because now, when it matters most, Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. Hulu has live news. And that news is ABC News. ABC News Live on Hulu. ABC News Live on Hulu. Watch the news you need. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Streaming to all Hulu subscribers right now. Cross my office off the list. What if we pick for each other? Please stop. Yes.
and welcome back. You're looking at video of New York City firefighters in a rare roof rope rescue. They're trying to get a woman hanging from the window of the 16th floor. The firefighters tied a rope to the 17th floor and dropped down to try and save the woman's life. Onlookers cheered as New York City's bravest reached her, calmed her down, and pulled her to safety. Well, in this moment of racial reckoning in our country, we've seen statues fall, schools, and even towns renamed in an effort to remove reminders of racism in America. But some communities are resistant, arguing the names are part of a history that shouldn't be erased. So how do we properly recognize our past while moving toward a more equitable future? Our Clayton Sandell on What's in a Name. In the shadow of Denver's old airport tower, people living in the neighborhood known as Stapleton say this place, with its big parks and modern homes, had an outdated name. Unfortunately, Stapleton was named after the airport, but the airport was named after Benjamin Stapleton, who was an active member of the Ku Klux Klan. Kimberly Brewer helped lead the long fight to rename Stapleton. For decades, that rebranding was rejected by voters. But in June, Brewer says something finally changed. I think we as a nation are beginning to grapple with the reality of our history and what is in a name. Along with nationwide protests against police brutality, there's a new reckoning for names and symbols that conjure racism in America's past. Take Colorado. There is great natural beauty here, but the state still has a map dotted with what some say are ugly slurs. Negro Mesa, Redskin Mountain, Squaw Mountain. We decided to hit the road to find others. First stop, the small town of Buena Vista. Okay, we just got to the trailhead here. It took us about two hours from Denver. It's pretty windy out here. This is a place where people bring their 4x4s, their off-road vehicles. It's a very popular place to go off-roading, but a lot of critics think it's got a troublesome name. This is Chinaman Gulch. Long before it was an off-road playground, local historian Susie Kelly says Chinese laborers came here to work in the mines and for the railroads. The Chinese man who lived up in that gulch, and they named it Chinaman Gulch because he lived there, but he lived there because he cut trees to make ties to lay the rails on. Kelly works at the local Heritage Museum. She says most locals just don't see the need to change a name that's been around for 130 years. It wasn't an insult. It wasn't done maliciously. I, I think they're making a big thing out of nothing, to tell you the truth. If you were walking down the street with, say, a friend, and a friend said, hey, look at that Chinaman. There goes a Chinaman. Would you consider that an insult today? Probably. But in 1890, I probably wouldn't. But today, Chinaman Gulch is on a list of controversial names being reviewed by the Department of the Interior. And Colorado's governor just created his own renaming commission. Historian Nikki Gonzalez is on it. The people in power are the ones who give the names um, to, to different places. And that reflects the values of, you know, these mythical ideas of American individualism, this rugged sort of approach to the West, this dominance, this superiority. The commission is tasked with examining some of the place names in Colorado that have been highly problematic and for once we'll, we'll have these conversations at the highest level of government in Colorado. Sky Roosevelt Morris and Tink Tinker are with the activist group American Indian Movement. They are challenging white America to rethink the stories of people long celebrated here as pioneers and explorers. We like to call them invaders, colonizers, because that's exactly what their mission was here, was to colonize and commit genocide against indigenous peoples. One of those famous names, Kit Carson. Carson was a premier Indian killer accounted for a number of massacres uh, uh, between Colorado and uh, California. This is where Carson's statue once stood in downtown Denver, but in June, the city took it down before it could be torn down. Carson's name is on streets and schools, military bases, and our next stop, a town 150 miles southeast of Denver. At the local trading post, Kimberly Brown told us scrubbing his name would be a step too far. My view on this thing is history is history. 
it's not there for us to like, it's not there for us to love. It's for us to learn from. And I feel erasing history, good or bad, it's, it's, it's not okay. I don't think it's okay. Not far down the road is a place with another troubled namesake. Out here on Colorado's Eastern Plains, Shivington is, well, more of a ghost town now. The man that it's named after is long gone too, but the pain and anger that he caused not far from here more than 150 years ago is still fresh. In 1864, U.S. Army Colonel John Shivington led soldiers in a massacre at Sand Creek, slaughtering more than 200 Native Americans, most of them women and children. It is a wound Native Americans say has not healed, which is why they say a high school mascot you'll find just 40 miles to the south is a painful insult. This is Lamar, Colorado, home of the savages. We're not anybody's mascot. We are our own sovereign nations, our own peoples. Locals tell us what they call Savage Nation has a long history in this community meant to unite, not divide. In our school, everybody knows like if we get called a savage, it's not offensive in any way. It's just, it's prideful. We're all savages. We've been savages and we love being savages. Acacia Truitt graduated from Lamar High. She started a petition to keep the name. What do you say to people though who say this is a racist, outdated symbol? We're not using it as a derogative term. People, when they look from the outside in, they don't see that, that it's something that we take a lot of pride in, and that's why people are willing to fight for it. That sense of community that we're all together in one. But not everyone. Nereda Aguirre graduated in 2012. She says she had no problem with the Savage mascot until she moved away to college. And we're all having discussion, you know, freshman year, talking about where we come from. And I mentioned the name of my mascot, and a bunch of the kids kind of looked at me and they're like, are you serious? You're not joking. I'm like, I'm serious? That's it. And they're like, that's actually really offensive. She's now back in Lamar, joining a group of alumni fighting to bury the savage name. We're in a moment in history and time where the choices we make are kind of, kind of influence the way we're seeing later on by future generations. There's other good things about that school. Mm -hmm. So focus on those things, take pride in those. We'll change the mascot and then we'll keep showing how good this community is. Even if that change happens, some activists say the real issue goes far deeper. Maybe if we are willing to address racist mascots and racist holidays and racist streets and racist statues, then maybe we can start to get to the heart of the issue, which is that this land is stolen, that this country is built on the genocide of indigenous people and the enslavement of black relatives. This is the beginning. Back in Stapleton. Denver has a new neighborhood, or at least a new name for one. Central Park will be the new name for Stapleton. They're now covering up the old signs, making way for the new. These names, I mean, they have the potential to evoke a, a very painful past, and that affects the self-esteem of, of young people. I think there's room enough for everybody's history. A moment where real change may be just over the horizon. This moment feels different, and I, I really do think something has shifted. With the spark of George Floyd's murder, maybe it's a point of no return. Clayton Sandell, ABC News, Lamar, Colorado. And thanks to our Clayton for such thoughtful reporting. And when we return, what you need to know to start, well, getting ready for your next Uber ride. And the photo of Adele stirring up controversy, cultural appreciation or appropriation. And today's closely watched Massachusetts primary race that could land another Kennedy in the Senate will break it down by the numbers. But first, our post of the day from singer-songwriter Ed Sheeran taking to Instagram to announce the birth of his new baby girl, Lyra Antarctica Seaborn saying both mom and baby are doing amazing and we are on cloud nine over here. In times like these, the news making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face to face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong Un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> 
Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward. Everything changes. Up here, there's only two kinds of people. Uncertainty is what I thrive on. I wanted to see if I could make it on my own. Those who are still standing and those fighting to survive. Mother Nature setting the rules, and all I got to do is slay her game. That happened so quick. New season of Life Below Zero, followed by the premiere of Next Generation, Monday, September 7th at 8 on National Geographic. I'm so excited to be the new host of Dancing with the Stars. Monday, September 14th, we'll be back in the ballroom live. It's gonna be 10! 10! 10! And you will not believe who's dancing this season. Dancing returns September 14th on ABC. We turn now to today's closely watched primary elections in Massachusetts, where progressives are facing off against the Democratic establishment with some new twists. We take a look at this remarkable race by the numbers. 74-year-old Senator Ed Markey, who co-wrote the Green New Deal, is running for re-election with the endorsement of progressive leaders like AOC and Senator Elizabeth Warren. Despite his 44 years in Congress, Markey casts himself as an anti-establishment insurgent with millennial appeal. No sitting U.S. Senator has ever lost a contested primary in Massachusetts. His challenger is 39-year-old Representative Joe Kennedy III, whose great uncles were President John F. Kennedy and Senator Ted Kennedy. His grandfather, Robert Kennedy, also served in the Senate, and if elected, Joe Kennedy would be the fourth Kennedy to join the body. No Kennedy has ever lost a race in Massachusetts, and this Kennedy is endorsed by establishment heavyweights like Nancy Pelosi. Close to one million Massachusetts voters had already cast ballots before polls opened today after the state extended mail-in and early voting. With an expected vote total of about 1.5 million, the state is likely to see the highest primary voter turnout in three decades. And when we come back, the future of the massively popular social media app TikTok in the U.S. could become clearer. And an alarming sight for pilots flying into LAX, what they saw 3,000 feet in the air. And examining the origins of violence in American culture, our talk with Democratic Senator Chris Murphy. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Now could be a good time to have another baby. Are you crazy? I'm in love with you. Now that I said it out loud, it does sound weird. <laughs> I feel so Please stop. When I see you were so fine, I had to remind myself to breathe. I feel something when I see you. Let's do this. How's your quarantine going? <sighs> Welcome to Disney Plus. Are you ready? Drop in and explore the action, the adventure, and the originals. There's no limit to what you'll find. These are your worlds. 
So come on, dive deeper into the universes you love, wherever and whenever you want them. You'll find them all here on Disney+. Plus. President Trump arriving in Kenosha, Wisconsin this afternoon. We're going to help the people rebuild their businesses. Before his arrival, the family of Jacob Blake, the black man shot seven times in the back by a white police officer, making their feelings towards the president known. We need a president that's going to unite our country and take us in a different direction. But while demanding justice for Blake, who's now paralyzed, the family gathering at the site of his shooting for an afternoon of service, holding a community cleanup, hosting a barbecue and voter registration drive and calling on the community to remain calm despite the president's visit. The president is not meeting with Blake's family, but is visiting with law enforcement and surveying the damage of recent unrest. Uh, we will provide $1 million to the Kenosha law enforcement so that you have some extra money to go out and do what you have to do. You took a rough, it was a rough week to put it mildly and uh, you've done it incredibly well. Six months since the first reported COVID-19 case in the U.S. Despite an infection rate below 1% in New York City, pressures from one of the largest teachers unions in the country now means the city will delay the start of in-person classes. To make sure that the health measures are in place, to make sure there is time for the appropriate preparation for our educators. It's not just grade schools. College campuses in every state have reported clusters of new infections. Today, the president continued his push for college football to restart, talking to the commissioner of the Big Ten. So we had a very good conversation, very productive, and maybe we'll be very nicely surprised. Uber riders must wear masks, and if they don't, the company says they could be required to take selfies to prove they are. Riders with past violations will see this screen, the app activating the selfie cam, the technology then scanning your face for a mask. It'll even be able to tell if the mask isn't covering your nose. Uber says it is not using biometric information from your face and that it will store the photo for four days just in case there's any complaint filed. The Manhattan District Attorney's attempt to gain access to some of President Trump's tax returns has been put on hold for now. A decision by a federal appeals court delays enforcement of a subpoena for his tax returns, while the president appeals the decision that let the subpoena move forward. There could soon be a buyer for TikTok. Reports say a deal for the app's U.S. operations could be announced soon. The leading contender in that hunt is apparently a team-up of Microsoft and Walmart. Software giant Oracle is heading up another group eyeing TikTok. TikTok. The sale price is expected to be at least $20 billion. President Trump issued an executive order saying that the app would be banned in the U.S. unless TikTok's Chinese parent company sold its U.S. business. Are men dying out? New research reveals the Y chromosome may be shrinking. That crucial piece of DNA for those born as males only contains 45 genes. Scientists going so far as to call it wimpy. 200 million years ago, the Y chromosome used to hold over 1,600 genes. Meanwhile, the X chromosome is holding strong. It still has 1,000 genes, according to Latrobe University. So while the Y chromosome is pretty puny, researchers think it still has a fight chance for sticking around for maybe four and a half more million years. And welcome back. A bizarre close call for airline pilots approaching a major airport. They reported seeing another person in flight, but not in a plane. They were flying solo, apparently using rocket boosters. Our Gio Benitez has the story. Tonight, a scare in the air over the skies of Los Angeles. A person wearing a jetpack, apparently flying at 3,000 feet. Aircraft. A person with a jetpack on their back is flying through the air. Airline pilots spotting the person on their way into LAX. We just passed a guy in a jetpack. Don't hear that every day. Another pilot spotting him too. We just saw the guy pass by us. An incredibly dangerous close call Sunday evening, one that should not be taken lightly. The size weight of a person in a jetpack impacting an airplane at the exact wrong spot could potentially bring that airliner down. Human jetpacks are growing in popularity and may even go as high as 12,000 feet. Some people even using drones to take flight, like at the Portugal Cup. 
and you could just see the kind of damage a drone could do after this suspected strike to a plane over Mexico back in 2018. And Kira, tonight the FAA is investigating. The FBI is looking at this too. So far, police have not located that person with a jetpack. Kira. Wow. Gio, thanks so much. Well, global pop superstar Adele is facing backlash over a recent social media post. The singer wearing her hair in Bantu knots, a traditional African hairstyle. And now the superstar is caught in the crossfire of an argument over cultural appropriation versus appreciation. Our Janae Norman takes a look at that. Adele is at the center of a debate about the line between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. The singer sparking controversy over this photo, posting, happy what would be Notting Hill Carnival, my beloved London, meant to honor the annual festival celebrating British West Indian culture. Many black Jamaicans considering it a compliment that the songstress wore a Jamaican flag bikini and her hair in Bantu knots to celebrate a Jamaican carnival compared to wearing it as a costume. You do see a lot of folks of Caribbean descent defending her, if not giving her permission to do so and asking the rest of us who are not of Caribbean descent to basically mind our business because we don't understand the particular cultural context, which I hear and which I get. But it also reminds me that who of us really is in a position to give permission the response wide ranging across the black diaspora and highlighting the nuance often neglected and overlooked within the black experience. Some black Britons unbothered like David Lammy, a member of British Parliament, pointing out the festival's tradition of dress up, adding that Adele grew up in Tottenham, a highly diverse and multicultural neighborhood in London, so she gets it more than most. Adele's really popular, she's from the area. And Notting Hill Carnival is the biggest street carnival in Europe. It's not uncommon to see lots of white people dressed in Jamaican bikinis and Japan with dreadlocks. I think that's why some people have been like, well, this is good. It brings exposure. Um, but yeah, there, there, there is also people who've had a deeply negative response. But some black Americans taking offense. Ernest Owens, an award-winning black American journalist, calling it the cultural appropriation that nobody asked for, adding, hate to see it. We know very well that Adele is not going to wear this hairstyle to the red carpet. So you appreciate it in a particular context insofar as it's a costume. We don't have the luxury of taking on and off our hair as a costume. Cultural consultant Dr. Yaba Blay says it's the traditionally black hairstyle, Bantu knots, originating with the Zulu tribes in Southern Africa, that crosses the line from appreciation to appropriation. Even a black young girl in Tottenham couldn't go to school with those hair, in some schools couldn't go to school with that hairdo because it is, it isn't seen as acceptable uniform, right? So the hair has always been a really contested space, actually particularly for black Britain because of Rasta, because of dreads because of cane roll, or we say corn roll, I think in the States. But you know, hair has always been a political site of resistance. There is a continual and repetitive um, practice, if you will, of folks who aren't black being able to benefit from our rhythm without having to suffer from our blues. As a white woman, you are able to wear a hairstyle that many of us will be denigrated for. The response, similar to when celebrities like the Kardashians wearing cornrows and do-rags are hailed as fashionable, but others, specifically black Americans doing the same, are seen as unprofessional and in many states are still not protected from hair discrimination at work and school. I saw someone on Twitter say, well, if you're going to critique Adele for wearing this African hairstyle, then let's critique black women for wearing these European hairstyles. Those aren't those those aren't parallel arguments because, again, it's completely removed from the context of white supremacy. Much of what many folks think is a choice in this moment, I just choose to wear my hair straight, is again detached from a long history where we were required to wear our hair straight in order to be seen as acceptable, in order to be seen as professional. It wasn't a choice. 
Janae, thanks so much. Well, the protests and counter protests in Kenosha and Portland in recent days have underscored the deep divide in our country right now over issues of race, policing, and the use of firearms by both law enforcement and by everyday citizens, with protests in both cities escalating into violent and deadly confrontations. And now Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat from Connecticut, is out with a new book called The Violence Inside Us, A Brief History of an Ongoing American Tragedy, examining the origins of violence in America and what he calls our nation's obsession with firearms. Senator Chris Murphy joins me now. Senator, good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, your book talks about violence in America, particularly gun violence and its deep roots. How did we get to this point? Uh, violence has always been a part of the American story. And what I say in the book is that we were likely destined to be a more violent nation, uh, but we have chosen to throw kerosene on the smoldering fire by also allowing this nation to be awash in guns, especially very dangerous, powerful guns, especially guns in the hands of, wrong, of the wrong people. Uh, and so, well, we have to really take a big step back and understand that our, our racist roots as a nation um, have a lot to do with today's levels of violence. Um, the quickest return we can get is to make sure that there are fewer weapons out there, fewer weapons that are being brought to the protests that we are watching, fewer weapons in the streets of America, fewer weapons that are available to people who are having suicidal thoughts. If you take that step, you will see a pretty dramatic reduction in violence. But the book also makes the case that it is more complicated than just guns. You've got to understand why we, we started as a violent nation and attack those roots as well. And, and I want to get into what's happening to cities across the country, but j just to back up a little bit, because you say that your book is to make the other side less scared. There's a lot of people that are scared right now uh, on both sides. So what exactly do you mean by that? Well, I, I do think this has been one of these issues uh, where we have trouble coming together. I describe uh, an incident in the book where uh, a man is waiting for me after a speech I gave outdoors. Uh, um, a, a festival in Connecticut, and he's very angry with me. And he says, I want to talk to you because you're that guy who's going to try to take away my guns. And I very quickly try to get him into a discussion about what I'm actually for, which is universal background check. And once I do that, he says, well, I'm for those. I mean, I went through a background check. I think people should have to prove that they're not a criminal. Uh, and as we understand each other better, as we don't allow the NRA and the gun lobby to define this debate, we can find common ground. I say in this book that I actually think there is a constitutional right to the private ownership of guns, um, something that might surprise people. But I think there's an ability for us to have a common sense discussion about guns in this nation that you know unites at least 80 percent of us. And that is part of the answer for uh, what plagues this nation today. But you know that it's not stricter gun laws and background checks that are the only answer here. I mean, every day guns are being smuggled into this country and being used to kill people, guns uh, without any trace. And so how that is something that has to be tackled uh, uh, in, in, the, in the moment. Well, that's right. And the, the opening story of this book is the story of a young man named Shane Oliver, a 20-year-old, uh, who's killed uh, in a, a verbal dispute over a, a girl in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, just two months before Sandy Hook. And it was an illegal weapon that was pulled out of the car um, of his assailant in the middle of this argument that ended this very promising young man's life. Uh, but every illegal weapon starts as a legal weapon. The way that that gun got to Hartford is that somewhere along the line, some criminal bought it at a gun show or online uh, and was not uh, prohibited from doing so because there wasn't a background check attached to it. And then he sells it uh, to somebody on the streets of Hartford and it all of a sudden becomes an illegal weapon. But what about the guns that are being purchased on the black market? I mean, those individuals definitely aren't getting a background check. Well, but but that's right. But the but the black market um, starts often by the gun being sold outside of the background check system because the black market is run by criminals. And so how do guns uh, get to Connecticut and be sold illegally? Well, they get bought in gun shows in places like South Carolina and Florida. Those criminals buy them there where, where there are no questions asked, and they bring them up to Connecticut and sell them illegally. So by making it so that every gun has to go through a background check, 
uh, you you make some real progress here. Um, but I also make the broader point that you know Shane's life in Hartford had enormously limited possibilities. He probably didn't think he was going to live past 20, and that's in part because of the, the economic reality of so many young people who live in these inner cities. And there's a correlation between the number of illegal guns in your community uh, and gun homicides, but also between income and poverty uh, and your chances of being killed in gun violence. And so we need to address both of these issues. So you were first elected to the Senate in 2012, and that was just one month before the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary and in your home state. And you've been a vocal proponent of gun control measures, most of which have not been successful, even as these deadly mass shootings have escalated in recent years. Why is that? Well, the worst uh, moment of my legislative career was in the spring of 2013 when the background checks bill failed. I was with many of the families from Sandy Hook that day, and I tell the story in the book of you know, what it was like to walk out of the Senate chamber and tell these parents um, that we had lost, um, despite the fact that many people thought the world had changed after Sandy Hook. What we realized that day was that we, we hadn't um, lost the argument. It, it's that we just didn't have a powerful enough political movement. Um, unfortunately, this is all about politics in the end, and you have to be stronger than the other side. Well, that's what we've been doing for the last seven years. We've built up an anti-gun violence movement that is now stronger than the gun lobby is. We have groups like Moms Demand Action and Giffords in every town that are winning more elections than the NRA is. The NRA, frankly, is falling apart. So what I've learned is that you have to build political power. We're doing that. That's why we had so much success in 2018. Uh, and that's why I think that we'll have a lot of success on this issue in 2020. So final question, President Trump and other Republicans really leaned on the law and order uh, theme at the RNC and saying that they, they'll keep the country safer than a Democratic White House. Joe Biden has responded back that the violence we're seeing in this country is happening on President Trump's watch. Um, do you agree? Well, this is Donald Trump's America. I mean, Donald Trump would like to perform this Jedi mind trick in which he makes us all forget that he's president. and. and He'd like us to believe that Joe Biden is in the White House. Um, but we are in the situation we are in today with a pandemic that is raging out of control because of this president. We could have taken care of this back in the spring if we had a competent administration. And the president, in going to Wisconsin today, is seeking to fan the flames of unrest. He's decided that he's better off the more chaotic our streets are. And so uh, he is going to, unfortunately, do no healing. Um, he is only going to exacerbate the situation. Joe Biden stood up yesterday and condemned violence, no matter who commits that offense. Uh, he m reminded us all that violence in this country was going down during the Obama years. We've seen murders in our cities increase by 26 percent this year under Trump. There's a real contrast here, and, and I don't think any voter is going to be fooled to think that the America we're watching now is anything other than Donald Trump's America. Senator Chris Murphy, the book is The Violence Inside Us, and it is out now. We appreciate your time so much, Senator. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. We'll be right back. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Italians, they're the past. We're the future. We're the damn Roman Empire. Hey! Well, for you! What are they? Decorative? The warning to the other rats. Are we good? You tell me. 
This is America, sir. Last time I checked, not Soviet Russia. Fargo, September 27th on FX. Next day, FX on Hulu. And welcome back. Major NBA playoff action tonight. Game seven of the Denver Nuggets versus the Utah Jazz. Utah's Donovan Mitchell and Denver's Jamal Murray in a final face-off to decide which team will advance to the next round. And over at the U.S. Open, Naomi Osaka last night sporting a Breonna Taylor face mask ahead of her match, speaking out without even saying a word. And speaking of tennis, our image of the day, Andy Murray, in a moment of pure emotional release after defeating his opponent at the Open today, Murray winning in an incredible comeback, five sets, completely exhausted, but absolutely pumped. And the humble Brit, what did he say? Eh, I did all right. <laughs> We'd say you did, Andy. Well, that's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Kira Phillips, and thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night. What you need to know right now. Confirm